So we got a really, really good episode for the audience today. We're talking about something that I think most people in sales, whether you're in real estate or anything, deal with, which is call reluctance. And so today's episode, I want to talk about, or we want to talk about rather, how to overcome call reluctance, how to approach it. And it's just such a difficult thing for a lot of people in real estate sales to to face, to overcome, to get past. And um, I'm excited to do so. So and every, uh, everybody who's watching this live in our mastermind, good morning to you guys. Colton, you got the Facebook feed pulled up just in case anybody wants uh, to yeah, let me refresh. Yes. Ask good. questions, hang out. Again, can't come on the show yet, but I'm sure we'll get there. We'll get there. All right. So let's jump into, into this. All right. I have all kinds of I've wrote down all kinds of notes and, and I want to talk about a couple different things. However, before we do that, there's a really good book on this topic. And the book is called for the audience, The Psychology of Sales Call Reluctance. This is mm, by oh, wow. yeah, by George Dudley and Shannon Goodson. They have a whole company. Their whole company is a research firm that does studies on call reluctance and how to overcome call reluctance and they have all types of studies on it and it's a phenomenal book they have two books wow yeah it's great I didn't know that it's very interesting to have a whole company everything de you know dedicated to such a topic well here's what's crazy one of their main studies that they're most famous for showed this is crazy they showed that call reluctance is the reason why 80 percent of salespeople fail Wow, I believe it. It's yeah, crazy. And, and and then you look at real estate sales. We all know the stats. 87% of people fail out of real estate within the first five years. It makes sense that 80% of it is because they won't pick up the phone. And mm. we're not talking about, and they do a great job in the studies, call reluctance has, it's not just cold calling. You know, It's just people have a fear of the phone whether that's to to call anybody. there's a, I have a friend, I'll never forget this. Still to this day, we make fun of him for it. He, you know, back in the day, growing up, you know, it's like what everybody did. We used to hang out, get drunk, smoke cigarettes, do all the things, right? And after uh, 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 the night was about over, at about midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., we do what every drunk kid does, and that's order pizza. Well, this could this kid couldn't pick up the phone. Too scared. Can't order the pizza. Can't do it. Wow. Still cool. to this day, he struggles badly with just anything to do with communicating over the telephone. Call reluctance is a very, very, very real thing. I mean, yeah. they did all kinds of brain scans in this book, all kinds of stuff with people that have different levels of call reluctance. But when we talk about call reluctance, it's not just cold calling. You know, a lot of people have a tough time calling grandma because they just yeah. don't like communicating over the telephone. And so we're going to get into this to be really good. Yeah, absolutely. I, I find interesting something that was kind of that, that I found going through this was, um, it a lot of times can, can translate over into anxiety and maybe it's not as ex as extreme as what you're talking about with ordering pizza and whatnot, but a, a lot of people I've found it it's not it's a form of procrastination. It's exactly right? what it is. So hey, I've got all this stuff going on in my life, right? Money issues, you know, health issues. My parents are getting older, whatever it might be. Kids in school, I don't know what, but and then we sit down to do what it is we know we need to do. And we're like, man, I'm just dealing with all this stuff. And now I got to call this guy mm -hmm. yep. and I, I need a break. And we jump on and watch, you know, um, play Candy Crush or something. And then next thing you know, an hour has gone by. And now all of a sudden you feel guilty. Yeah. So let, I want to... That's what I was, I almost texted you guys because I wanted to get your guys' feedback on. There's two sides to this. There's mm. call reluctance that has to do with overcoming the fear. And then there's the other side of this, which is how do I 
fight distractions to be more productive. Mm -hmm. So I want to keep those separate if, if if you guys are good with that. We can get into both, yeah. but I thought today we'd get we, we'd really unpack the fear piece. We're not talking mm -hmm. about because the other big problem is what you're saying, Ben, is is just not being consistent, you know, being distracted, just it's a productivity issue. This Absolutely. is more like I, I'm I'm scared. I'm fearful of the phone. So yeah, if you guys are good with that, we could focus on that. Yeah, good? definitely. Absolutely. And I yeah. think in all fairness, I think they are totally separate things. And you know, you can fix both of those, but they're also interconnected in the same time. Like they are. your fear could be causing your procrastination. Um, yeah. but I think starting with the fear and unpacking that will then lead into maybe in a future episode, the, the procrastination side. Now that the fear is gone, how do we stay productive at the same time? That's right. And the way I have this broken down, at least on my notes, we can, we can dive into this conversation any way you guys want, but I have why first, first off diving into why we have call reluctance, then the mindset of how to overcome call reluctance. And then I've got, I think five, six, seven tactical ways to overcome call reluctance. Ooh. So, you know, what's funny is in, in our book, the reverse selling book, you know, I, I tell a story of how real this is. And this is where I think this conversation has to start because call reluctance is real. Nobody should feel bad if mm -hmm. they have it because it is a real thing. And I tell a story about how real it, it is and that there was there's a lot of people that that in the military, once they're done with their kind of like their um their 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 role in war, I guess you could say, they 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 progress their career into being a recruiter for the military. Mm. And I tell a story in the book that there are many, many military recruiters that would rather face death on the battlefield than pick up the phone. That's how real this fear is. That one person would rather face dying than talk over the phone. I got it from this book, one of these studies. It was in there. And, and they, they interviewed, not interviewed, they studied a lot of these military recruiters. And a lot of them, so much, they have the fear so much so they can't even be a recruiter in the military. They had to find a different job. They resigned and they couldn't believe it because it's like, man, you could face bullets and missiles and, and RPGs and tanks shooting at you. No problem. I could run into the line of fire more <laughs> so than I can pick up the phone and call an 18-year-old senior in high school and talk to them about joining the Marines. It's unbelievable. So it's a very, very real thing is the point. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's get into into why, right? And and some of this is based on studies. Some of it is just like, I guess, our, our thoughts. But number one thing I had on my list, I don't know what you guys have on yours, but I, I wrote down ego. Mm -hmm. Because when somebody has the the fear of anything, and, and this is coming from a guy who had a major anxiety disorder, and, and that's what's happening here is the ego makes it more about you than it is about the actual activity itself. It's a very selfish thing because a lot of people that have this call reluctance, it's all about how they feel about making the phone call. I don't want to feel this way. What if this happens? And then they get into the what if syndrome. What if that? And what if this? And what if that? All of those thoughts are selfish. It's all about, well, how am I going to feel mm -hmm. rather than what can this activity, in this case, making an outbound phone call, do for someone else? Yes. Mm -hmm. You see the difference? So mm -hmm. ego, and you know, we've been talking a lot about this off, off of the camera, like status. How am I being mm -hmm. perceived by others? It's mm -hmm. a total ego play, which is the root cause of this fear. Your thoughts on that? It, it, that was kind of my sub point of what you were saying is I, I've had this conversation three or four times in the last two days with people. And that's why we, we landed on it. And I think 
the, the thing that helped me the most was those two, two things were, were huge for me. One, uh, a mentor of mine 15 years ago told me, you got to lose your cool card, which is ego. That's right. You got to yeah. lose, which means you got to be able to be a little bit vulnerable. And then two, I personally had trouble with accepting the fact of the industry that I was in. I was embarrassed in the first place to be in XYZ, right? A subsection of sales. So for me, the first step was to understand what my profession was and accept that. And, <clears throat> and having and working through that was really discovering, do, am I willing to be this type of person? Because you can't avoid it. You, you, you are a salesperson. Yep. Right. And and for me, whatever real estate agent or whatever it was, I needed to accept that first because the 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 thing I was going through was I was looking, right? What we're about to get into, I was looking for validation through the people I'm talking to. And this activity is 95, 90% people not validating it. That's right. And the 10% that are. They might not even, they're not going to be a lay down. Hey, oh my goodness, Ben, I'm so glad you called. Come over, please run and bring a, bring a listing form for me to sign. Um, so I think we have to be really comfortable in our own skin of who we are, what we're doing and understand we're here to serve, not to sell, not to convince any of that. I, that was my big pivotal thing. I'm here to serve and I accept that I'm in sales and for some when I call, it might land wrong with them, but I know who I am and, and what I'm trying to do to help. Yeah. And and the other thing is too, and Ben, kind of as you were talking, I was just like thinking in my own mind of like things I've been reluctant of and why. And like, I think a big part of it not only has to do with the fear of others judging us, but we judge ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I look back on some of the first calls, Brandon, that I did when we started this company and I was, you know, enrolling agents five years ago into the program. And at the time I'm all, you know, I was watching all these videos and I'm all confident now. And you know, this is, I'm doing so good. And then I listened back to that call and I'm like, dude, like I'm embarrassed of how I sounded. And I think it's because we don't accept our ignorance and we don't forgive ourselves for some of the mistakes we've made in the past, we've all had those cringe moments where you look back on and you just, you're judging yourself and you haven't forgiven yourself or allowed yourself to go through those cringe moments. And so just like, accept that you're going to have cringe moments and that it's okay to, you know, judge yourself, but move on past it. I think we judge ourselves and don't allow us to move on through that. Yeah. There's two. Yeah. You guys nailed on two really important things. Ben, love what you said, and Colton, you, you're nailing it. The, the thing that, Ben, you reminded me of is prospecting is not a place for you to get your emotions um, affirmed by the prospects. Prospects don't owe us anything. It, it is an act of service, you know, and it's not a place for you to get the approval validation. from others, yeah. the validation. Approval. You're not going to get your emotions validated through the act of prospecting. And the problem with that for most is that is exactly what we're looking for in, in, in a herd mentality, which human beings over thousands of years are constantly seeking that validation from the herd. And this activity goes directly against that. And then that brings me to, to, to Colton's point. It's like, the the feeling of guiltiness of doing this activity, I feel ashamed even doing this activity because I have to call, I have to interrupt people's day, and I don't like the way I feel to do this activity. Because again, it goes back to ego because you believe you're doing it for you, but when you change the approach or the mindset that selling isn't something you do to people. It's something we do for people. Mm -hmm. It's something we do for and with people. You know, and when you understand that, that this act of calling people is for them, not for me, no. everything changes. 
So the worst thing, well, a couple a couple things on on let's stick on the why and then we'll get into some tactical things. The other challenge is, you know, not yes, the the feeling of 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 uh, embarrassment, right? I sound stupid and not willing to accept the fact that like anything new, I'm not going to be good and that's okay. The challenge with this uh, uh, of cold calling is the fact that when do we start doing it? Well, for most, it's after adulthood. And when we're adults, we think that we should be like the days of of new and learning are all behind us. And so we aren't good at this thing. So we don't want people to hear us. We don't we don't want to sound dumb. We don't want to be vulnerable and therefore I avoid all activities that put the spotlight on me to be exposed in this way. And I'm not going to deal with that. Go ahead. Consciously incompetent. That's right. That's it. You know, you suck at it. And that's why it makes sense when it, when the correlation to this, to failure is so high because we know the activity Mm. that leads to success and sales is the conversation with people. That's the number one determining factor, whether someone will win in sales or not. And if that is the number one thing people avoid, it makes all the sense in the world that that is the largest contributor to someone's demise. Hmm. So the other thing I wrote down is, well, not knowing what to say, I don't know what to say is the cause of me feeling vulnerable or sounding stupid. Or to Colton's point, feeling cringy. It's like I call them, you know, the neck gets all red. I start pitting out. I get all nervous and I sound stupid. I start stuttering. All of that is true when you don't know what to say. And we'll talk about some ways to to overcome that. And then lastly, I have on the why, and I want your guys' thoughts, is the worst thing that someone can do. This is the ultimate um, kryptonite that fuel uh, that fuel that that is the fuel to fear is avoidance and ben you hit it you hit on it any anxiety and i went through this with the whole overcoming of it, of my anxiety disorder where i couldn't even leave the house i don't even know if you guys knew that or not it was mm-hmm. tough for me to even get out of bed believe it or not and the thing that fuels fear is avoidance yeah that's why they say face fear face on and fear will decimate because fear is fueled by the avoidance. And so every time someone avoids, they know they should be making their calls, Ben, but every day they don't do it, they're fueling that fear even more. Your guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard um, people talk about this, but the the biological and physiological uh, signs of fear, you know, your, your heart starts pumping, you're getting kind of sweaty, you got that little pit in your stomach. It's physiologically the exact same thing that you go through when you have excitement. It's the same thing. The difference is the story you're telling yourself about it. That's the thoughts you're having. It's the ego trying to get in the way and tell you whether it is fear or excitement, you know? Um, and so, yeah, you, you, you just feel into that, you know, this, Feel the fear and do it anyway. Like you just got to get comfortable with that feeling and you're never going to be 100% ready. As Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. So you could study your scripts and know what to say all day long for the next two months. But the first call you make, you're going to feel that fear and it's going to fuel you to avoid it like you talked about. Yeah. Ben, you have any thoughts on that before we move on to mindset? Uh, No, I I think... I think the the biggest thing is just understanding, like we've said, we've kind of beat it going into it, just understanding what you're doing, because if you don't believe in it going into it, you're going to validate all the reasons why you shouldn't be doing that. Oh, look, there, there's two people that just yelled at me like I knew this doesn't work. Bam, I'm not I'm not going to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're going to get into that heavy in a second. Go ahead, Cole. Well, you want to add something? The last thing, the one step beyond you, you I forgot to say you mentioned was uh, the fear as fuel, but also the other side of not knowing what to say. 
I would go a step beyond that and, and, and even more so say it's not as much. It's different for everybody, but most of the agents I've brought this up to when we explore this together, it's not so much being told over the phone to go pound sand or getting yelled at. You know, sometimes it's this, you know, it, it, a lot of the times it's like, oh, maybe that guy's having a bad day. It's the step of the unknown beyond that. It's like, well, what if I actually set an appointment? Like, what if they want to That's meet? right. It's yeah. that unknown. It's that not knowing what to do, what to say, what to bring when you're face to face with somebody that scares people more than getting told to pound sand on the phone. Yeah. What if someone says, yes, come over my house? Then what? Now I'm Fear really success. screwed, Colton. Yep. Yeah, it's so good. So, so then this leads right us uh, us right into the mindset. And, and the first mindset is something Colton said just a minute ago that has to do with our, our our comfort zone. And what I have said for years is the only evidence that we have that we know that we're on the right track is when things don't feel right. Do you guys catch that? In other words. For a real estate salesperson, the only way that they know that they are tracking towards success is if they have the feeling of un, of being uncomfortable. And we know that when we're comfortable, we don't we're not growing. Right? There's a whole thought of homeostasis, you know, and people don't do anything when they're when they're comfortable. They mm -hmm. stay status quo. It's only when they're outside of their comfort zone are they growing. I'll give you the greatest example of this analogy of, of, of the comfort zone. So you guys have heard it a thousand times, but it's the thermostat. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're sitting in your living room, this is literally the comfort zone. Like, what do you keep your thermostat at right now, Colton, at, at, at the house? Like 65. 65. Okay, so for me... That would be well outside of my homeostasis. It'd be well outside of my comfort zone. Be outside my would, budget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would put me into action. That's the point. That would yeah. cause me to leave the couch to go increase the temperature because I'd be shivering, frozen with yeah. a hat on, goggles, the whole thing like Addison I'm going skiing. <laughs> What's that? That Addison hates it. Well, to be fair, that's when I sleep. I've got to sleep at 65 Throughout the day, sure. it's like 68 if I get cold, 70. But yeah, I'm going to bed at 65. <laughs> I don't hate that. And, and so the same thing is happening in sales, right? It's like you're, you're not actually in action unless you're uncomfortable. And, yeah. and if you're comfortable all day, that means you probably aren't doing that many things that push the boundary. It's not mm -hmm. putting yourself in a position to perform. I think you said something about that yesterday, Ben, on the show. It's like you have to put yourself in a position to perform. It's like going to the golf tournament for the first time. You needed that in order to grow. If you're just playing golf by yourself every day, you're not getting better. You're making it too comfortable, right? That's what you were saying? Absolutely. And it, and it, it, Darren Hardy talks about the success pendulum, right? The, the amount of discomfort that you put on yourself is the amount of success that you can experience. It's so, my favorite. It's, it's shaped my entire life. The the pain, uh, pain, pleasure pendulum. So if you're not getting the results you're wanting, and you're just experiencing, you're just tiptoeing in. Like it's just, it's not possible for you to get where you want to go. You have yeah. to take go to that next level. Well, let's let's just for the audience's sake, so we don't leave them on a on a island. Let's the the pain pleasure pendulum. How it works, real quick, is. We all know how a pendulum works. It's like when you swing it on one side, it swings back equal on the opposite side. And so this is what Darren talks about, is that the more pain we put ourselves in, because pain is a controllable. Hmm. Pleasure is not. Pleasure is a byproduct of the amount of pain we put ourselves in. So as an example, we can control how much pain we put ourselves in, what time we wake up, what time we go to bed, if we're making the calls, we're not making the calls, our, our diet, if we're working out, if we're how, how often we go to the range and we hit balls, all of that is stuff that we can control. That's pushing things on the pain side. And the further we push ourselves on the pain side, the pendulum theory says that it will swing back on its equal axis 
on the success side. To your guys' point, most people live in what? The comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit of pain. So they only experience a little bit of pleasure or a little bit of success. And then they wonder why they're not reaching their full potential. Potential must be pushed on the side of pain so that it can come back on its equal to reach success. Does that make sense? It does. And, and it's and it's also a different kind of pleasure. Like a lot of people are pleasure seekers. So mm. they'll, they'll they'll watch the Netflix, they'll have Great the thing, point. And, and they're on the, you know, the they're seeking pleasure now, which leads to more pain later, which is hard That's to get right. out of that pain. Versus if you seek that pain now, it'll it'll swing you towards the right side of the pleasure and, and it's hard to get out of that because you're you you know what I mean? Mm. Like and it's oh, that's a really effect. dude. That was so good, Colton. That, that's a that's a Coltonism, yeah, because he's yeah. he's right. For the pleasure seekers, the people addicted to dopamine, to addicted to easy things. The easy In our thing is to leads. Yeah, th that's right. The easy look is at to, it. Look at Zillow. Buy the Zillow yeah. leads. Buy. That's you right. Swipe your credit card. You you get that pleasure of a lead, a deal but then you don't experience the pain that comes with it versus the people that build their foundation of their business through outbound prospecting. Now they, they're in control. They can have whatever they want. That's the most practical way is what Ben just said. It's like, you could take the easy path. Now what you think is easy now, go swipe your credit card, but then you are in massive pain later. This is called second order consequences Buy buy the leads. Now don't build the database. Forget yeah. that. And you will find yourself in this business 20 years from now, still having to chase leads down. So the mindset is this. This is the first thing that I think has help, helped me out a lot. You know, when I think about, okay, and I ask this question to agents all the time, and I say, okay, if I were to give you a client and they were ready to list their house, and I said, okay, you're going to deal with, with this agent. And I say to Mr. Agent, would you do a good job for this person? Yes or no? Well, yeah, I would do great. Would you do what you say you're going to do? Yes. Would you Would you screw them? No, no, I, I, would, I would do really well. Would you call them? Would you update them? Would you do a good job? Yes, I would do a great job. Okay, great. So is it fair to say then that there are going to be hundreds of thousands of people that buy and sell a house in your market this year? Yes. Okay, cool. And if you worked with them, you would do a great job. Yes. So then it's also fair to say it's selfish of you not to offer to help them. <laughs> because if you say to yourself, I would do a great job for this person and at the same time not offer to help, isn't that being selfish? In other words, if your friend had a disease that was going to result in her losing her left arm and you were sitting there with the cure the whole time, and you didn't say a word to your friend, that would be selfish. Yes, of course. Well, what is our cure? Our cure to people's problem is we list and sell houses. What is the problem? The problem is people need to move. And in order to move, they must buy and sell a house. So well, therefore, by not offering to help, not offering the cure, that is a selfish activity or behavior. Go ahead, Colton. And it proves from our point earlier, like if you, so again, recapping that analogy, you're afraid to do the thing, but you have the cure for it. And so it's selfish of you. And what we were talking about earlier is a lot of the people think they're, you know, afraid of being judged by being this and that. If your friend judged you for trying to give her the cure, would you give two craps? No, right. like you can hate me. I don't care. You can never talk to me again, but I'm going to save your life. And so it shows once again, you're just judging yourself. You're just placing those limits on yourself when you do that. If you know you can help somebody, if you know they're in pain and you're not, you don't care about what they think. You're you're just kind of caught up in your own world. Yeah. 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 Well, that's true. Yeah, you're right. It's like you're 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 relinquishing yourself from the guilt. Yeah. Hey, do do what you want with this. I'm at least offering to help, which is a mindset, which is I'm not calling anybody to sell or to convince them of anything. And we're going to get tactical in a second. But that is exactly the point, is if your mindset is, well, I'm going to call and I got to try to convince this person to say yes. Yeah, that brings up all kinds of issues. You're going you're gonna to face all kinds of challenges. 
But if the mindset is I'm going to call and offer to help this person, knowing that I can't help everyone, it changes everything. So the next mindset is, well, how do we do that? The mindset is detaching from the outcome is to not base this activity, the success or the failure of this activity based on what happens, but rather the success or failure of this activity by doing the activity or not doing the activity. Mm. In other words, the goal is to make the call. The goal is not to manufacture an outcome. That's where all the problems come in. How am I going to be perceived? What is it that I'm going to say? Are they going to like me? Are they going to be mad at me? Are they going to yell at me? Am I going to get a lead? Am I going to get an appointment? Am I not? Am I going to sound dumb? Those are all outcomes. Mm -hmm. The win, Ben, is the actual phone call itself. And when we attach our emotions to the action and not the act the 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 outcome the outcomes take care of themselves couldn't couldn't agree more and it just starts with one thing right just fire up the dialer yeah right just hit start and and don't make it about you turn it into like a game turn it into a, an experiment right hey i'm going to see how many people i need to talk to to i know most of them are going to say no but I'm going to see what what amount I can get to say yes, not by convincing them, but just by sorting through people. Because right. I know what I have to offer. I'm not going to convince anybody to do anything. So let's just see how many conversations I can have. And let's just take it one at a time. Don't get so overwhelmed by, I got to do 30 contacts for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that brings us right into the tactics. Tactic number one is understanding that prospecting is a process of sorting. It's mm. like sorting gumballs, right? The gumball machine, the red gumball, blue gumball, right? And you're just putting quarters into the gumball machine. You're looking for the blue gumball. And if it's a red gumball, what do you do? You don't want to attach an emotion to it. You just throw it in the trash. Next, yeah. next, 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 next. You're just sorting gumballs, knowing mm. You can look at the machine and see clearly there's a lot of red gumballs, but somewhere in there is a blue gumball. That's what prospecting is. Prospecting could be argued that it's not even a sales activity. Hmm. It's, 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 a, activity. it's a marketing activity. Yeah. That's what prospecting wow. is. Yeah, I know. Isn't that interesting? Se mm. Selling doesn't happen until you've identified... You, you've gone from suspect to prospect to opportunity. And so, yeah, Colton just nailed it. Prospecting is a marketing activity. And we don't wow. start selling until we have identified somebody who has a need. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, I like red gumballs and blue. So, you know, it's hard, it's hard to throw them away. I think what popped in my head is like mining for gold. Like yeah. think of all the dirt you got to throw away to That's find right. the little nugget of gold. Um, yeah. We just have to understand it's all red. It's all dirt like most of the time. And we're yeah. just love that marketing. Yeah. Well, and then the, the next mindset I wrote down is the fact that yes lives in the land of no and no is okay. Because mm -hmm. once you accept that, I know we throw that around a lot in our world, but like some, some, I bet you someone's heard that for the first time just now, right? So yes lives in the land of no. What that means is whether you get a no or a yes, both are good news. Both are good news because prospecting not only is a process of sorting, not only is it a marketing thing, but it's a process of disqualifying. Nope, can't help you, can't help you, can't help you, can't help you. That is as good news as... Finding the person you can help. Why? Because you can't help everyone. Not mm -hmm. everyone is a good what? Fit. And so the fact that you found someone that isn't a good fit, wouldn't that be reasonable to say, well, that is success because I moved them out of the way on my journey to serve one someone? Yeah, go ahead, Colton. If anything, it should be a relief because you'd rather yeah. find out a no in the first few minutes than trying to, you know put a square peg into a round hole for weeks and weeks. It's like, oh, thank God I can go find the yes. 
Yeah. And inviting someone, we're in the tactical piece, inviting people to tell you no relieves yep. all pressure mm -hmm. from them and from you. Yeah. It's, it's what I call anti-rejection selling. So much so, and I don't even know if I've ever mentioned this to you guys, so this will be the first time on, on a live podcast. So much so that I believe if you can sell in this manner, objections are no longer a thing. They don't exist. If you use an anti-rejection approach, there's no such thing as objections. You've eliminated them all. Well, what do I mean? What do I mean tactically speaking? Right? Because everyone's like, well, how is that possible? Well, here's the tactic. If you use language that would support one's autonomy to decide on their own to self-identify a need or not, then all pressure is removed when you assume that there isn't. Here's an example. So if I were to call Colton and I would say, Colton, I'm not even sure this call makes sense. You see, that is the assumption up front that you've taken away from the prospect. I'm not even sure you'd be interested in this. Mm. And you can use language like that up front then the prospect can watch this. If they agree to that statement, there has been no rejection because you brought it up first. And then when they object is when they shown interest. <laughs> Did you see yep. that? So if I say, listen, I'm not even sure this call makes sense. And Colin says, well, actually it does. He's objected. And by his objection, he self-admits interest. Mm. That is yep. the anti-rejection sales strategy. It's the foundation of reverse selling. Colton, what do you want to add to that? No, you just made me think of, and I, I don't think I've ever told you this either, but you know, I, I think this was when I this was like my first year license. Like before I knew you, before before any of this, I think I found you on YouTube. And I Shocker. was Shocker. Yeah. All the way five years ago back then. And I was prospecting and I started to notice like, God, man, every FISBO I call, they all, they're all saying the same thing. Like, oh, you're the 10th agent to call me today. But do you have a buyer? This and that. So I'm like, all right, what if I just tried this? And, and I, and I kind of gathered this from watching some of your videos. I'm like, well, let me just try this. I would call them and say, hold on. Let me guess. Am I like the 10th agent to call you today? And they're like, you have no idea. And I'm like, well, I'm just genuinely curious, like, what are these agents telling you? Are they lying to you saying they have a buyer? Like, I'm just curious, what are you hearing? Yeah. And like that opened up the, now that's not, I wouldn't recommend that as a script per se, but just, just as a example of like, if you start to pay attention and pick up on, I was just starting a conversation, just confronting what I knew was going to come to me up front. Well, that's the importance of a pattern interrupt. Mm -hmm. and And to illustrate this point, there's no better way to do that than to think about the scene in the movie Eight Mile. Okay, this is what we're talking about. So we're talking about in, say, in sales, like, oh, I don't want to be rejected, right? This is a huge problem in call reluctance. Well, what if there was a world where there was no rejection at all ever? And if you think about the movie in Eight Mile, the last rap battle, Ben, have you seen that movie? I have not. Of Come course you have <laughs> I, I, I knew I knew he wouldn't. I, I was looking at his face. He's like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. So, <laughs> so for every other human on the planet, except for Ben Riles, that has seen the movie Eight Mile with Eminem, the last rap battle, they go back and forth, right? And and in underground rap battles, the the goal is you you essentially win the crowd by uh, by making fun of your opponent in a way that comes out in a rap. Right? That's why they call it a rap battle. So at the last scene, this is the best example of the anti-rejection script that I've ever seen. It's the better pattern, best pattern interrupt of all time. Eminem gets on stage and he starts making fun of himself. He starts what? using all of the ammunition that his opponent would use on him. So much so that his opponent comes on stage and says, I got nothing. You win. <laughs> That's it. Because like, I got nothing to say. And so disarmed if you did him. that. Yeah, you disarmed him. So what if we did that on, on a sales call? 
Okay, mm. so let me give you a really, really practical example. I'll give you the script, right? This is probably one of my favorite scripts to use on a sales call. You call Colton. Colton says, hi. I say, Colton, listen, this is Brandon. Hey, you probably don't like getting calls like this as much as I don't like making them. Mm. This is the fastest way to disarm a prospect. This is how you pull strategic empathy. Because you've called into court or into reality the thing that both people are thinking that no one says, which causes people to reject or, 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 or to push back sales resistance, you yeah. brought it up. And because mm -hmm. you brought it up, the prospect then can't do anything but empathize with you. Yeah. When you recognize the fact I'm interrupting your day, you probably don't like this as much as I don't like doing it. But Colin, I was hoping just to ask you something really quick about the home for sale. Would that be okay? Get their permission. Almost every time this results in the prospect says, sure, go ahead. Because you've pulled strategic empathy, and that's the how. You guys' thoughts on that? Nothing, if you're right? Scared you got of nothing objection. To say. If you're scared of objection, just start with that. Try, if try you're, something different. Don't get objections. That's my That's argument. Right. Stop getting them. Getting objections is your fault because right. you have a responsibility on how people respond to you. If you're mm. getting rejected, that is a result of you eliciting psychological reactants. You're doing it. You're right. giving the person the reason to say, no, I'm not interested. No, take me off your list. The same way you walk into a department store and the worst thing these people are saying is, how can I help you today? That is the worst thing they could say. Yep. <laughs> and they keep getting the same damn answer every time. Nope, I'm, I, I'm not, you know, just looking, just, just looking, looking, just looking, yeah. just looking. It's like you would think somebody would train these people and to say something else like, hey, I know you're just looking. If things change, let me know. Wow, what a great pattern interrupt. Hey, guys, I know you're just looking. I know you're so bored out of your mind that you decided to leave your house to come to my store to just look. So if that changes, let me know. Right? Yeah. Back, back to our boy Bradley. He's got a funny one for that. He's like, yeah, your, your, brother's be your brother Ben's here. Ben looking. You know, and your, your cousin <laughs> Drew's here, you're still's here, still looking. You know, and he kind yeah, of breaks yeah. it with some comedy. But I was going to say – um, all but 10 minutes before we, we jumped on here, Alex Hormozzi just posted a new sales training on YouTube. And I'm like two minutes into it. And the way he kind of described that, the whole objection thing is, you know, I don't know how, how this finishes, but I'll open the loop is, you know, the objection is something you face at the end, whereas the obstacle is something you can kind of work through in the beginning of a sales call, right? So yeah. if you save it to the end, it's an objection, but it's an obstacle in the beginning if you confront it up, up in there. If you can confront it up front, you're saying... Yes, yes. Yeah, listen, I'm not cheap. I'm expensive. This is, this is a lot of money. Listen, this is a big decision. It, it has to do with, objections come at the end, to your point, because the salesperson's beating around the bush. They don't have confidence mm -hmm. to confront mm -hmm. it. They're, they want to hide behind it, and it always backfires on them, always, in all cases. Mm -hmm. yep. And so, you know, if you can lay on the grenade up front, you can disarm it from ever being an issue. That's what you're talking about. A couple other tactical things, right? So um, we kind of skipped it all around, but number, the, the, I don't know what number this would be, but another tactical thing would be to practice and, and role play and to record your practice sessions prior to the activity of actually doing it. Because this has everything to do with confidence, mm -hmm. everything to do with confidence. And so in order to build confidence, just practice. Get reps, 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 yeah. reps. Get a great role play partner, role play it, record it, listen to the game film. Go ahead, Ben. If, if you can't stand listening to yourself, how do you think the prospect feels? That's Why, right. What makes you think that they're going to want to say yes? That's right. Another thing, and I'll get through these quickly. You have to make the morning, you have to do difficult things in the morning prior to picking up the phone. This is how we build mental toughness. So we recommend you win the morning, you win the day because you can ride the momentum out. Here's what we know about human beings. 
Once they start doing difficult things like waking up early, going to the gym, taking a cold shower, you start to build resilience. You start to build mental toughness, which is what you need to be a successful hunter in sales. You can ride that momentum that you built in the morning and keep doing difficult things. That's how you build confidence. That's how human beings build that mental toughness is by proving to themselves that they can do hard things. And so that would be another tactical thing. Another thing, start and stop at the same time. Control the controllable, right? Instead of avoiding it, like, oh, I'll get around to it. No, you will not get around to it. If you put this, oh, I'll, get, I'll do it later. No, you will not. You start and stop the same time. And you make this a, a, a habit that you start at this time and you end at this time. And start off small. It, to mm -hmm. overcome call reluctance, start off small. You can't control how many people pick up the phone. You know, we, we talk a lot about contacts. You can't control any of that stuff. We can't control most things in life. What we can control is, all right, I'm going to start off with 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. At 8 a.m., I'm going to call. I'm going to detach from the outcome. I'm just going to make calls between 8 and 8.10. Yeah. And at 8.10, I'm going to stop no matter what. No matter what happens, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to build on that by using the Jerry... Springer system. You guys know this? Hmm, tell us. All right. Jerry Springer. This is where this came from. Jerry Springer, for those of you that don't know, probably has um, not Jerry Springer, Jerry Seinfeld. What am I talking about? Jerry <laughs> Seinfeld, the Seinfeld, Seinfeld. So he's got probably the best show of all time. Jerry Seinfeld. What he did was he was responsible for the for a system that most people use now. He wrote every day, no matter what, he sat his butt in the chair and he said, I need to write for an hour every single day. And every time I do that, I earn an X, a big, huge red X with a mm -hmm. Sharpie on my calendar. Jerry Springer, Jerry Seinfeld. So funny. I said that. So he was the one that created this, that it became famous now in habit creation or habit formation. And the gamify becomes to not, it becomes not breaking the chain. The chain of those red X's or blue X's, whatever color Sharpie you like the best, purple, whatever. You have these row of X's, Colton, that stack up day after day after day after day. The human being doesn't want to break that. And so it becomes a game of being addicted to what? The action, not the outcome. And then the outcomes take care of themselves. And in this case, Seinfeld has one of the best shows of all time. Mm -hmm. Right? So that'd be the other tactical piece is... Set a time limit, do the activity during the time, and then you earn the reward, which is the X. This is the starting mm -hmm. piece of habit formation. Ben, you said something earlier at the show, and I have this, um, this last tactical piece, is the just one theory. Mm -hmm. and, and this is really good. It's that even on the days you don't feel like doing something, it's the anticipation that crushes us. Because in most cases, as soon as you start doing it, you're like, I'm fine. It's the whole thought of like, everybody always says this. As soon as I get to the gym, I'm fine. It's just the getting my ass to the gym is the problem. But as soon as I do the first rep, I'm fine. That's the just one theory. And it works so well in prospecting. It's the thought the night before in the morning of, oh, I just don't feel like I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. But as soon as you make the first call, you're like, oh, not that bad. That momentum carries is enough in many cases to carry you through a whole prospecting session. So the tactic is don't make emotional decisions in your anticipation of an activity. Mm -hmm. Do one rep and then decide to continue or stop. And if you want and, to stop allow after yourself. one, do it. Yep. Yep. Allow yourself to take a step back. That's right. And if you still don't feel like it, let yourself off the hook. You won't have the guilt that I think a lot of people feel when they don't do anything. They don't, they don't do it at all. Right. And then do it again tomorrow and maybe do one more and then let yeah. yourself off the hook and build that muscle. That's right. Gentlemen, it's been fun. Everybody, is there any questions from, from our live audience uh, in our mastermind, Colton? Someone uh, uh, earlier mentioned, and we kind of touched on this, but I feel my call relevance comes from not knowing what to say, what if I say the wrong thing, fear of the unknown, et cetera. 
Yeah, and, and we talked about that on the show a little bit, but I'll just add that we have to accept failure as part of the process to succeed. Mm-hmm. You know how we talked about yes lives in the land of... Who, who asked that? Oh, let me go and find it. It was Victoria. So Victoria, we talk a lot about yes living in the land of no. Well, failure lives in the land of success. Like you can't have one without the other. So this is why we embrace failure Mm -hmm. because it's through the land of failure that you reach the land of success. You can't go around Mm it. So anytime you say to yourself, oh, I don't know what to say. I don't want to sound dumb or somebody hangs up on you. That should be celebrated. It shouldn't be something that we feel bad about because it's through that failure that we actually get to success but let me make a comment um in our coaching the way that we start working with somebody is we do lay the foundation first we make sure that they have pieces so that when they do make the calls they do know what to say now i think what you're saying is you don't have to know everything right but we do lay the foundation. You, you've got your listing presentation. You understand what your resume is. You understand how to follow up with somebody so that you have enough confidence to start doing the activity, but you're not going to know everything. And we can't know everything. The learning is in the doing, but there is a level of preparation that we do recommend before yeah. even starting to make calls. There's no doubt. There's no doubt that before you even find yourself making phone calls, that you have written out your script 10 times over 10 days. You have chanted and role played the script. You've memorized the script, you've internalized the script, and you have personalized the script. And you have practiced, you've role played, you've got tons of reps on your belt to build confidence. That for sure, we can't take that away. But at the mm-hmm. same point, when you face fire for the first time, no matter how much preparation you've done, you will still learn more in the act of doing than you will in preparation. Right. Both are important, though. Both are important. That's yep. right. Any other questions from the audience, Colton? Another uh, good saying someone put down there was that uh, tomorrow, Jake said, tomorrow is the place dreams go to die. Mm. Procrastination. Yeah. So oh, yeah. good, man. Yeah, yeah. Why put off... How does it go, Ben? Well, I you're put the... tomorrow, what can be done today? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's like every second counts, you know? And that's like how I live a lot of my life. I think it drives you guys crazy a little bit. It's like, I'm always on you. Like, well, let's, let's get into this. You know, let's, let's work. Like, why wait? Anyway, um, great show today, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Everybody in the live audience, the Mastermind, appreciate it. Every day we'll be back here at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Everybody who will watch this replay on YouTube, if there's a topic you guys want us to discuss, throw it in the comments, and uh, we'll be happy to cover that in a future episode. Finish out the week strong. Let's rock and roll. We'll see you guys in the morning.